We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Good afternoon and welcome, welcome to all of you to today's panel discussion on racial disparities and how to implement change. I'm Nicole Hamilton, so good to be here with all of you. Now, in preparation for today's talk, many of us have heard it being said that the world is on fire. We've heard that being said. And many of us would also say that the world has been on fire for generations. There's an urgency that's happening for more conversations, conversations like this one. And in particular, there is an urgency for action to take place. Today, the hope is that conversations such as this one will manifest into this wonderful path that will allow and shape for all bodies to thrive. And so today I'm pleased to now welcome an esteemed panel of guests who will be sharing their thoughts on today's discussion, including historical references in ballet, stereotypes and their connection to history, where we are now and the implementation of change and the abolishing of stereotypes in ballet. Please join me in welcoming Bengt Jorgen, artistic director, co-founder and CEO of Canada's Ballet Jorgen, Teresa Ruth Howard, founder of Memoirs of Blacks in Ballet, Barry Hewson, Executive Director and Co-CEO of the National Ballet of Canada, Mavis Staines, Artistic Director and CEO of Canada's National Ballet School, Tanya Howard, first soloist with the National Ballet of Canada, Kirsten Mariah Fentroy, soloist with Boston Ballet. Welcome to all of you. Great to have you here with me. So good to see you. Thank you. Now, this morning, uh, you will notice that Mavis is missing. Mavis will be joining us shortly. We're just having a technical uh, difficulty, and we are looking forward to having Mavis join us in just a short moment. But again, I welcome all of you to the table. Welcome to the conversation. This morning I'd like to do, or this afternoon, part of me, I'd like to start with placing the lens upon us as individuals. I've received many messages from individuals in anticipation of today's talk. Some who are viewing today have confessed that they are so hopeful. Many are tired, some are scared, and some have also confessed that they are extremely uncomfortable with having conversations like these. And so to the panel, my first check, my check-in this afternoon is, how are you feeling in this current climate of racial disparity as members of the ballet world? Tanya, I would love to start with you. Welcome. Tanya, if you can share, please, your thoughts on how you're feeling at this time. Hi, yes, I'd love to start. Um, you know what, I feel all those things. Um, and I think during the COVID period that has sort of given us all that time to reflect and to sit at home, I, I feel like I've gotten through a lot of different um, feelings about, about these conversations. And um, I won't, I, I won't lie. I will, one of them was like, let's not even bring it up. Let's just leave it and try and sort of keep, keep going. And then 
it goes through um, and what ultimately where I've where I've landed now is that it absolutely has to change. It cannot go back. We cannot use any historical reference um, about anything, about how we designed a costume in the past, about how we um, how we cast, how we uh, relate with each other in the studio. It just um, it just can't stay the same. But those things are really scary. They're very big topics. Um, they're very personal topics and they're personal in very specific ways to individuals. So this is not going to be one conversation because the conversation that you may have with uh, Kirsten um, and then the conversation with me, um, while they'll, they'll be similar and they will have some um, crossovers, it's entirely uh, personal to to an individual, which makes this so much harder and such um, uh, more of a bigger task. I'm glad you said that it's individual because that indeed is is what it is. It's very different. Each person's experience is going to be completely different from the next. Thank you for that share, Tanya. Kirsten, your thoughts, please. I echo a lot of what Tanya had to share. Um, I too have gone through a variety of, of thoughts and emotions and um, especially since mid-May, uh, I feel like I have gone through moments of initially feeling afraid and frustrated and angry, then very, very hopeful, followed by again feeling afraid and, and concerned that, that, that this change won't come and we can talk about it as much as we want, but th will the change come? But currently today, I'm feeling hopeful. And, and in the past couple of days, I've felt hopeful and encouraged that the work is true and it's genuine to the people that are trying to do it. Um, and I'm just happy that I can be a part of this moment and, and use my experiences to help shape the experiences of those that come after me. Well said. Well said. It seems like it's this rolling ball um, for for all of us, for many. We go from that space, Kirsten, as you mentioned, you know, going from hopeful to to joy, to peace, frustration, anger. So there's there's all of these different feelings that are arising for individuals. Thank you for that, Kirsten. Teresa, your thoughts. How are you feeling in this moment? There I am. Um, uh, again, we're all on this, this roller coaster, um, especially in the States. Um, but relative to ballet, I have a, I have mixed emotions. I mean, I immediately, I say like, welcome to the dance because this is uh, sort of a com conversations and work that has been ongoing for many years now and has been sort of ramping up. And I feel that this sort of flashpoint that we're in currently, um, the combination of COVID and the BLM sort of protest um, sort of expanding um, has created a, an incredible opportunity for people to, to connect with it in ways that perhaps they weren't before. Um, so it's, for me, it's, it's, it's almost like um, an incredible opportunity and I feel like I want to like dig in right now and try to figure out a way to to maximize as much work as possible while we're in this incredibly um, vulnerable and and sort of like human space. Mm. Indeed, and I've heard you say before, Teresa, moving things from the headspace to the heart space many times. So that human, that human position is so key right now, especially as we come together to discuss this and dig in. Thank you for that, Teresa. Barry, your thoughts, please. Sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me to be part of the conversation. Um, I would say, um, you know, I'm, I'm a white male. Uh, I'm American uh, living and working in Canada. I feel more Canadian every day. Um, but I, I have, uh, I've struggled uh, at times um, with feeling like I'm sort of the enemy in the room in, in this conversation, um, when in fact I, my intention is and has been um, to, to help uh, support change in an industry that I love and an art form 
that I also love. And so I've, I've been working uh, to understand my place in that conversation and, um, and my responsibility. Uh, and so that's been um, uh, obviously amplified in the last few months, but we've been um, at this uh, for a number of years now. Uh, and I think what feels different this time is that it does feel like as an industry, uh, there's a collective leaning into the work um, that we've been talking about this for years. We've been talking and talking and talking, and really, um, it's about action. It's about intentionality, um, and that's that's what feels different and makes me feel hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, thank you, Barry. Feeling like the enemy in the room—that's something that I often hear from individuals that come into spaces, in particular white bodies that have been sharing with me over the course of the past many months, that feeling of discomfort and feeling uh, the fear of being canceled, the fear of not knowing what to say. Thank you for being so honest in your, in your share, Barry. I do appreciate that. Banked, um, I'd like to go to you, please. Thank you. Um, and I, I would say that I echo both Teresa and Barry to some extent. Um, you know, one of the responsibilities that I have is, of course, to support our artists and three quarters of them are of a color. So the conversation internally has been very important to make sure that we are uh, responsive and that indeed we provide the kind of inclusive environment that we, we really want to and strive to. Uh, I think right now is a great opportunity for our uh, profession that I love, the art form, to make sure that we move forward um, for the sake of everyone, but also for art form. We need to make sure that change really takes place because we want to include everybody. We want everyone to be included. We want everyone to feel welcome. And uh, if we don't, we are not going to succeed to keep this art form vibrant and alive. So this is, this is essential to us and it is an opportunity for us to do a lot better. And I wanna be part of that conversation. Uh, but as Barry, uh, you know, I am a white guy and, um, you know, I'm very aware that uh, I don't wanna impose myself on the conversation. I wanna be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Thank you for that. You know, one of the things as you were speaking that came to mind, Banked, is there were students that wrote in in preparation for today's talk um, that were really concerned about the fact that conversations like this keep happening and change does not seem to be on the horizon. Because the big question is, how do you change mindsets? That's what a lot of students have been saying. How, how do you change someone from recognizing that my body has no worth to recognizing that my body does have worth? How do you change a human being's mindset? So I thank you, Banks, for that share. And I'm hoping that this conversation will allow for the arising of new thoughts and spark more thought for individuals that are watching today. Teresa, I'd like to come to you because many are saying that they want diversity in ballet. So what is that? What is it that we should be talking about when we think about the word diversity? It's a good question. It's a tricky question. Um, and the more I, I, I do this work, the more my sort of perspective evolves. Um, so you can look at diversity in a number of different ways, right? You can look at it in terms of um, nationality or ethnicity or, or race. And so when we talk about diversity with the big D as we are now, I think that um, most companies would say, oh, we're, we're international. We have a lot of different people, types of people represented. But the thing that we can all kind of across the board agree is that, that um, the number of black dancers and specifically black females. And if you want to drill down even further, black females of a certain hue are not represented. And so for my work, it, I'm, I'm very clear about how I'm addressing um, diversity um, because I think that there are totems of um, you know, levels of diversity that are represented. For instance, um, we do see a high level of, of Asian dancers from different countries represented in companies around the world. Um, not enough, but they are in high ranks 
all the way through companies. You also see this with Latinx dancers. They are, they are, uh, they are usually found in companies. You might find maybe one, two, maybe three. And again, higher in rank as well. Um, and that's you know the tradition of, of Cuba and the tradition of Brazil. A lot of dancers are coming out of those those countries. Um, however, for the, the the black dancers, it's 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 they're not the numbers are not equal to the the way that we are represented in a number of these countries. Um, and so for me, I'm very specific about when I'm talking about diversity in terms of black dancers and diversity, you know as a whole. So then in that case, one of the things that I'm looking forward to discussing is that representation of black dancers in particular. We're going to be discussing that in uh, during the course of today's talk. Thank you for that share, Teresa. So then Barry, how does what Teresa said resonate with you? What lens are you looking at diversity through? Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, particularly in the last few months around um, the difference between um, representation, which I think is what uh, sort of ballet leadership has been looking to is, do, are, are, is does our company represent um, the community that we serve? And um, at the National Ballet of Canada, we have in the last number of years increased the ranks of, of our uh, black and non-white uh, roster across the board. So the National Ballet of Canada, from a representation standpoint, is more diverse than it's been in its history. Uh, but what, I, what we've really learned over the last number of months is that representation is not enough. It's really about um, the lived experience of, of walking um, and living through this organization. Um, do people feel uh, respected? Do they feel safe? Uh, do they feel like there's a pathway for them through the organization? Um, and what is our responsibility as leaders uh, to ensuring that that environment is one in which uh, everyone can thrive? And I think that that's, uh, that's been on my mind uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, particularly um, in the last uh, number of weeks as we've thought about, um, I think we were, I think at the National Ballet, we were taking some pride in the fact that we were visibly making change in the way the company looked. Uh, but what we learned is that we're not doing enough to support those artists in a way um, that makes them feel those things, feel safe, respected, uh, supported, and that they can see a path through the organization for themselves. Excellent, Barry. Thank you. I think it's important that, you know, one of the words that stuck out for me there was, was thrive. Among the many that you shared was thrive and ensuring that all bodies are feeling that safety. And so, Banks, your thoughts, please. Um, can you also share, not only to Teresa's point, but I'd like to know how this also resonates with you and what lens you're looking at diversity through. Um, yeah, it's a, a great question. And um, I think that ballet, uh, you know, for me, it is a language first and foremost, and it's not tied so much to the aesthetic of a dancer. Um, and it's important that in, you know, when I look at a dancer, it isn't about body shape or size or color, it's about how they dance. And I think that we need to focus, you know, it's my personal belief, but it's one that, that I'm steering my company through, that um, we need to look at the aesthetics of ballet. It's, it's sometimes led us into a, a bottleneck uh, or a, a one-way street where we forget to look at the person and people connect with the people dancing. Um, the passion, uh, you know, a great dancer is a great dancer no matter what they look like. Uh, and I think so the aesthetics is something that is a, a challenge for us uh, in ballet when we let that get ahead of us. Um, and so I think it's really important with the lived experience that Barry was referring to is that it's real. So, you know, we can have all sorts of great policies, you know, uh, but if you don't live by them, if they're not real, they don't mean anything because, you know, it's, it's really about being a principle based organization. So we're striving, I'm striving, my team is striving to make sure that the lived experience is real and that we really, as an organization, uh, do not put people out there because they look a certain way, but 
you know, uniquely that they're great dancers and that we, we really do not look at height and size or any of that. And, you know, I think that's one of the distinguishing features of our organization is that, you know, n no, not one single dancer looks the same way. And, and we take pride in that and we try to support that. And we believe that is the path forward uh, for a conversation with many of our colleagues who challenge some of the stereotypes that we have in the sort of ballet body. And it drives a lot of things uh, and not necessarily just the diversity question of race, but it is an important conversation and uh, one that we are consistently having internally to make sure that, that we stay true to that. Excellent. Thank you. Right now, I'm thinking about what Teresa has shared with, you know, again, the headspace to the heart space that is coming to mind for me as, as you're speaking, Banked. When we're talking about those lived experiences, Tanya, can you share yours? When we talk about diversity in particular, what does that word mean for you when you think of diversity? So, I feel like I could split it down the middle for me and have two very uh, different experiences. Um, growing up in South Africa in government sanctioned apartheid, like it, it wasn't just one person that said, no, you're not right. It was the government that said, you're not allowed to go to that place or, um, you know, fill in the blanks. But, um, this, is, this has been very, very hard for me because um, ballet in South Africa, for me, was the thing that I belonged to. It was the thing that um, stripped away a lot of, a lot of um, any of the other things, where I lived, what neighborhood I lived in. When we came to the studio, we were just all doing ballet together. And um, I had a conversation with Leora Mahatla, who is with Bejar. And he's a South African boy as well. And the two of us are generations apart. I don't even know how old he is. He's probably 18. He's very young. Um, but he said the same thing. He was like, soccer didn't work out for me. Um, uh, swimming, whatever the sports he mentioned. And then he said, you know, ballet was the one thing that worked out and sort of elevated him. And um, and then if I go back in my memories of, and, you know, then just to split that, if I go back to... Um, so we had three channels growing up. And um, once we saw uh, Giselle from Ballet Creole, I think, and the, the dancers to me all looked the same. So then I was also confused with that there is this one sort of shape, even though it was a black shape, but there was this one thing that ballet was kind of saying this is the one and you know and it was echoed um many times over like the ball show they all look exactly the same um so i i've been finding it very confusing exactly how i feel this word diversity um echoes back to me so i'm sorry i i don't feel like i can give you a clear answer to that because i'm so split um the way i grew up and and how um how accepting ballet was of me, and then to to have this hear that the you know ballet has been so um, so isolating for for people as well. Individual experiences, right? Yeah, I, I, I as you're talking, I, I'm really really curious to hear, uh, Kirsten. We're going to come to you in in a moment, Teresa. I would like to hear your thoughts on what Tanya has shared, because Banked also made mention of aesthetic earlier in the conversation, but can you share your heart, your thoughts on what Tanya has shared, please? I think it's, I think it's interesting because there, there are, at Tanya, as, as you were talking, I wrote down that oftentimes the culture of ballet um, overrides other things. Right, so the culture of of ethnicity or 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 even national nationality, right? Um, I think that sometimes when you ballet is an interesting animal because if you fit inside it, right, aesthetically, right, to jump off of what Banks is saying, then your journey through it, your pathway through it, differs from someone who perhaps doesn't fit as nicely in, in, into it. 
right? And so, so this is what makes this conversation about um, inclusion. Let's let's even take diversity off the table. Just to talk about inclusion in the art form. Um, so complex because it's not just um, one thing necessarily. There's a combination of things that makes it a right fit within the culture of ballet itself. Um, and and it's it's very common for people to have their own personal journeys. And so that is the lens through which they see ballet, right? And so that makes sense, right? Like if you, if you um, whether you're a person of color, whether you're a short person or a tall person, you experience, you have your personal experience and that for you is ballet. Um, but if we look at it as a field um, and we look at just like statistics, numbers, um, then, then that that's a different way of looking at what might be problematic in the field or might be just a little antiquated, if you will, um, in the field is the way we're, the way the world is now in 2020. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that, Teresa. Kirsten, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on that share in particular from Teresa further to that. What are your thoughts? Um, I actually kind of have a similar thought process to what Tanya was saying um, in that in being brought up, I'm from California, um, but in, in being brought up, I ballet was the was the place where where I felt like I belonged. Um, it's the place that I didn't have to wonder if I why I was the other. I'm biracial. And so everywhere that I went, I didn't look like either side of my family. I didn't fit in in any place in society as a kid. And that was really hard to process. Um, and I didn't really understand the like cookie cutter aesthetic that we keep talking about until I left home and moved to New York to study ballet full time. Um, my mom, I think, did a really fantastic job of, of my mom, who is white, and my dad, who is black. Uh, she did a really fantastic job of, of raising me and teaching me that when I'm in a ballet space, my skin is beautiful. And so as, as a young child, she, she kind of trained me to have a positive mentality about being different. Um, so it was sort of jarring to to be new to that cookie cutter aesthetic at a later age. Um, I started my professional career at Dance Theater of Harlem. So when I left ballet school, I went into a place that a space that was created for predominantly black people. Um, and I spent several years there and I learned who I was as an artist there and what diversity meant there. And in taking that knowledge that I got from that space and moving into Boston Ballet, which is more predominantly white, um, I sort of got the understanding that in my perspective, diversity is representing every person that could walk down like a New York City street. So having anyone that is able to identify with someone that is on stage, um, whether that is someone that's black or whether that is someone that is Latinx. Um, so just circling back to like the, the, what diversity means to me, um, I, that, that I guess would be my answer, but it's really hard to say. And I think, um, so much of it has to do with what is included in the spine of whatever ballet institution you are in. Um, and, and making sure that everyone is incorporated in everything that comes out from, from the spine outward and is not like a patch that's put on to create diversity. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, you know, I, Nicole, can I, can I, can I say something really quickly about Dance Theater Harlem? Please do. Because I really think it's, it's interesting that as we talk about the issue of you know the lack of or diversity in ballet um we're always talking about it through the lens of whiteness right as if there's not an archetype for the lens of blackness in ballet that was dance theater of harlem and so um you know it's like you know ballet wants to act like it's creating the wheel with this idea of, of inclusion but we already have you know the blueprint for creating a space like this, and that is Dance Theater of Harlem. Um, although it was created in, in 1969 um, with the intention of proving 
um, that Black people could do ballet and creating a, a, a space for them, it was always uh, multicultural and always multi-ethnic, right? And under the, the umbrella of Blackness. However, it was very quick, very quickly sort of integrated, if you will, so that it was just a space for anybody who, who wanted to dance at all. So, you know, the idea that ballet has to actually quote unquote learn how to do this is in itself, I think, actually a very culturally specific thing, a culturally specific thing to, to whiteness, right? If you can call whiteness a culture. Um, but in fact, in the black context of ballet, um, it's already inclusive and and open and welcoming. Do you find, Teresa, that there is sometimes a confusion or misunderstanding of the 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 wording inclusion, diversity? Do do you find? I I mean, I could give you a list, but do you find that there is this big misunderstanding in terms of? what all of these words means, what they represent for organizations and for human beings in general? Um, I like to think that people are probably relatively well-read on this, especially, you know, ballet leadership. I don't, I think that sometimes the splitting hairs about not understanding um, what we're actually talking about is one of those things of like, well, are we talking about diversity with a big D or a small D, right? Like, are we talking specifically about what we're lacking most? Are we talking about the, 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 the idea of what ballet in fact is, right? Like what makes up ballet? Is it pink tights? Is it a smooth bun? Is it white skin? Is it the aesthetic, right? That's the thing that we have to interrogate. And it's the hardest thing for um, artistic directors to really sit down and open up about like, what are we actually talking about when we say, you know, um, the aesthetic of ballet, because that is not a fixed and stayed thing. That is something that is, that has evolved through, through time. So, you know, it's a question of what you're holding on to and what is, what the, what is the essence of the form? itself. And I think that if we can all agree about what the essence of the form is, right, it's the movement, right, the technique itself, then we'd be having a very different conversation. Ah, okay. So don't move because I need to stay on this and you for a moment, Teresa, because you you come to us with a very unique perspective. You reside in the U.S., you've worked around the world, including ballet organizations here in Canada. In a discussion prior to today's panel, you were noted as saying, we need to shift the culture of ballet so that we can feel good there and inhabit space there to be our authentic self. So then if we're talking about the culture of ballet, then how does history and aesthetic play a role in that culture? And I'm coming back to that as well, because I heard, uh, Banked, you mentioned that word aesthetic as well. So talk to us about that, Teresa. What is the culture of ballet? How does history and aesthetic play a role in that? And Balanchine comes to mind as you are speaking. So if you can share, please. I mean, history, it's very interesting. Ma Ballet did a symposium, and one of the, the panels was about the implicit bias in in dance history curriculum. And Adeshola Akinlea, Dr. Adeshola Akinlea um, posited that the purpose for history is actually um, propaganda and programming. It's to, 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 you know, create the context for, you know, who we are, you know, where we are. Um, and I think that ballet does the same thing, right? I think that we hold on to the ideas of um, I, I look at like a molecule, like the, the art form is the nucleus and then things attached to it. And we, we begin to recognize it as a very specific thing. Um, and we, and there are, are uh, gatekeepers to keep the quote unquote purity of it. But if we're actually honest that about it, dance is always evolving and it's always um accommodating um, the next thing, right? So like Balanchine decides that he wants a small head and long limbs and a short torso and everybody goes, yeah, 
we respect him and that's the aesthetic we're going with. And then it gets extrapolated from there, you know, but we're still kind of on that same um, through line because we, as a value system of ballet, respect Balanchine, right? And so it's a very, very narrow lens, if you will. Um, and so I think that history is a very narrow lens, right? Because it's, you know, written by the victors and it's highly edited and it um, is generally uh, scribed through the lens of whiteness, you know? And so a lot gets left out, um, including the fact that, that not only black people, but people of different races were participants and contributors um, to the molding of the form. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> oh, it does. It does. Thank you, Teresa. And also for those of you who are listening and watching, we would love to receive your questions as well. Please do submit them. Feel free to comment your questions. We will try to get to as many of them as we can within the time that we are here together. So thank you, Teresa, for that share. And we now welcome Mavis. Mavis, we had some technical difficulties, but we're so pleased that uh, Mavis is joining us now. Mavis, welcome to today's talk. Thank you. Mavis, if you can just come into the screen just a little bit more the other way the other there we are hi mavis great to see you we're sorry that you had some technical difficulties but we welcome you to today's talk mavis um one of the things that we started off with today and we're curious to know from you as well when we talk about diversity and we think about what each of the organizations and even as individuals what that means can you share as an educator how you are looking at diversity for the school. And if you can take yourself off mute, Mavis. Um, so I think that um, if you had asked me that question even uh, uh, three or four months ago, I would be giving a very different answer from what uh, I'm about to share now. So, um, uh, like um, many of you, I can imagine, who are listening to this program, not only did the world get turned upside down uh, with the pandemic, but uh, crisis really um, uh, allows an opportunity, if you look at it in the best light, to uh, see where you've been blind and where you've been stuck. So uh, in terms of um, the past few months, I think, with uh, the impetus from Black Lives Matter and um, from the uh, uh, impetus um, and um, the uh, really appropriate insistence on the part of uh, NBS students and alumni, I think that uh, um, I now recognize that um, uh, the diversity that um, we all should be striving for is uh, to say that um, anyone who has a, a passion for ballet as an art form or for a dance or for dance should be uh, made to um, feel that they belong and that it's also up to schools to make sure that the pathways and channels that lead to the opportunity for people for whom it's not a hobby, it's uh, a sense of calling, a sense of being whole. So um, I would say that um, uh, a goal is to make sure in the long term that uh, the population of Canada's National Ballet School reflects um, Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Mavis. Any other shares from the floor as we continue forward? Well, I'd like to continue the, the talk on that because as we look at the scope of what we are facing, the reality is that there is uncivil, or pardon me, civil unrest. Black voices, we hear about, about uh, the black voices that are being amplified in the dance community in ways that some of us have never seen. Dialogues are, occur are occurring. Black indigenous people of color are crying out, marginalized, racialized dancers are saying that they have had enough. So where are we at? 
because for many of the individuals I've just mentioned, the wonder again is that are we continuing without action? So I'd like to address the statement that is often heard, which is that there are not enough Black, Indigenous people of color to hire or populate professional ballet spaces. And this is why they're not commonly hired. So Mavis, I'm going to come back to you. Does the school intentionally seek out Black, Indigenous people of color? And if so, where? Mm -hmm. um, again, um, the answer now is yes, but I would have to say that um, I really need to hold myself accountable in that that wasn't intentional enough for me as the uh, artistic director and CEO of the school in the past. Um, I had uh, um, someone on our, uh, our board um, who is uh, um, really holding uh, me and the school's executive director accountable in the most um, uh, helpful and, and at times inspiring a voice saying, um, not only what are you gonna do in the immediate Mavis, but uh, what are you doing to ensure that there are uh, uh, black leaders in the future? Um, and uh, for any of the roles that are especially impactful. So in the immediate, what we've done is over the course of the summer, when we were able to start programming again, um, and uh, now, opening up the new school year is to shift the school's curriculum so that uh, with um, a couple of Toronto-based artists' help and the school's artist in residence, Peggy Baker, to make sure that uh, we uh, are hiring um, uh, between nine and 12 uh, artists of uh, diverse experiences, backgrounds, um, including black artists to um, teach the uh, students and um, also uh, to make sure that uh, we're now doing what we can to uh, see that when we are able to uh, hire uh, a guest ballet teacher, um, when uh, the next opportunity is for that uh, within this coming school year, that uh, we make it a priority that the guest teacher be a member of the black community. And uh, then uh, parallel to that, uh, working with uh, students in the school and staff and, and also uh, um, some of my colleagues who've been leaders in developing um, uh, uh, future um, uh, holders to uh, um, ensuring that um, there are not only white uh, leaders in the next 10 or 15 years to say uh, we've been really focused on doing that um, uh, in one area related to uh, community initiatives. How do we build on that and use that learning so that the same thing is happening within the professional program? Thank you, Mavis. Thank you for that share. Barry, I'd like to go to you as well. Same question, please. With regards to BIPOC dancers, does the National intentionally seek out Black, Indigenous, people of color, dancers who identify as BIPOC, and if so, where? Sure. So uh, the National Ballet of Canada actually um, is blessed to have a, a fairly low turnover from year to year. We have about 80 dancers in the company. Uh, and on an annual basis, there there is turnover in the apprentice program, which is in, an intentionally a, a two-year program. So dancers who are uh, invited into that program are here with us for two years, and then they either have to get into the company or they have to move on. Um, and so we see some turnover there and opportunity there. Um, and in the main company, um, which is the bulk of the company, um, there's, there's very low turnover. So change, uh, quite frankly, is slow because of that, that uh, because people tend to come here and stay here. Um, 
that said, um, we don't do uh, national or international auditioning. So if you want to audition for the National Ballet of Canada, um, you need to um, either uh, come to Toronto and take class with the company to be seen uh, by the artistic staff and by Karen Kane, the artistic director, or you submit video and resumes. And I can tell you on an annual basis, uh, we get more than a thousand applications from all over the world for positions in the company. And uh, in, uh, in my work with Teresa, uh, Teresa Ruth Howard and I have been working together for a bit now. Um, and in our conversations around how to change uh, this part of the conversation, we've talked about, about intentionality, about really almost creating the way Major League Baseball has a recruiting <clears throat> system where scouts are sent out uh, uh, around the country and around the world to identify uh, talented uh, players that um, we almost need that same kind of scouting system. And there has been, in fact, cases in which um, Teresa has, has sent me an email or, or uh, uh, got on the phone with me and said, look, there's this young dancer in New Jersey who I, I think is super talented, might be really interesting for your company. And she has sent that resume and let that, those video links. And then I walk them into Karen's office and I make sure they land on the top of the pile. Um, and that is, um, something I, I don't have uh, an absolute solution for at this point, but I think there has to be more intentionality that this idea that, you know, you're just gonna you know, open it up to um, submitting resumes from around the world and hope that, uh, and, in the, and the reality, the other reality that I'll just share at my time at Boston Ballet, we did do international auditions and we would have, you know, in one year we had 1,600 dancers audition for Boston Ballet, of which there were 40 dancers of color, um, and uh, so so there is uh, there's a need for intentionality and finding a way for those resumes not to get lost in the pile, and that those that those opportunities be obvious and available, especially when there's only a handful on an annual basis. Uh, uh, and lastly, I'll say that I, I spent 15 years working at the Baltimore School for the Arts, which is a public high school for the arts. Uh, it's an extraordinary school. And, you know, and it's interesting that the most talented uh, black dancers at Baltimore School for the Arts in their senior year of high school, when they're looking at either going to university or uh, entering the workforce, um, they're, they, they almost without a fail um, are looking at Dance Theater of Harlem, they're looking at Ayla, Ailey, or they're looking at going to Europe. And um, and I spent a lot of time with those dancers. You know, Jackie Green, who's a, an incredible star of Elvin Ailey now, is a graduate of the Baltimore School of the Arts. And I remember when she was a senior, I had a long talks with her about where do you, where, where do you see yourself? What do you want to do? And she just didn't see herself in a historically white ballet company. And um, and I, I think we have work to do to, to, to help uh, talented young dancers from wherever they come from see themselves in these companies because that's really also going to be part of the change. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Barry, for that share. Begged, your thoughts, I saw you nodding a bit, your thoughts on the same question, really, with regards to BIPOC mm -hmm. dancers. Are, are you effectively getting out there and seeking out back BIPOC dancers, pardon me, and if so, where? Well, we're in a slightly different boat than the National Ballet and some of the other companies. Over 50% of the people that apply to us are not white. And as I said earlier, right now, 75% of our dancers are not white. Uh, and I, But I think to Teresa's point earlier, you know, there are a lot of, of well, not a lot, but an increasing number of dancers from South America and Asia mm -hmm. and, and many other countries with diversity, but they're not as many black dancers. And we have had at sometimes up to 45% of our dancers being black. And, you know, that for a while, and then it disappeared. Uh, and we have not directly intentionally been seeking out uh, dancers, partially because a lot of the dancers that, that do audition for us are of color. But we do sense uh, and really believe that we have to work uh, in underserved communities where ballet may not be as well known. So our focus has really been to ensure that our art form goes up free of charge and that we have education programs free of charge in communities that normally don't have access. I think what we have thought about, and this has really come out of a conversation with our dancers, they, they really feel that we need to do a better job of helping young uh, kids of, of diverse colors, uh, black, uh, brown, uh, to 
find a path into our field and that we need to do more work at the very beginning. Uh, you know, usually we, we wait till people come to us and we usually, even in our education programs, we are a partner with George Brown College, it's a post-secondary program. So by the time people come to us, their path has already been chosen to some extent. So, you know, where we're going to direct more of our efforts is to try to partner with, we have about 400 schools across Canada that we partner with. We are going to try to work harder to try to find ways to support those schools uh, in getting more kids of color into their programs at the early stage and then support them so that they'll have a path through to the National Ballet School or other professional dance schools or, you know, through the schools they're with into professional careers. So we think we can do a better job than we've done. We have not intentionally been seeking out dancers. To your question, do I think that there are enough biracial dancers to fill ballet companies? Yes, I do. Um, I think coming back to the core problem is the aesthetics uh, and the culture. Culture is very hard to change. Uh, it's easier for smaller companies like ours that are built from from the ground up, we can, you know, we, we reflect the societies that we grew out of, you know, older ballet companies, they have uh, many more things to carry with them. And it's always hard to change culture. So I feel for them. And I, I, I really want to support them in their in their work to change this, because I think the change of culture is the key to to improving uh, this, this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Banked. Yes, the, the question surrounding black indigenous dancers of color has come up extremely often as we approached today's talk, because it's it's heard and it's said so often that they are not, black, indi black indigenous dancers of color are simply not hired because they can't be found, and in particular for ballet. So I think that's why it's especially important that we open up and really dissect what that means for dancers who are seeing that, experiencing that, and really concerned about that that aspect. So I do have some questions that I'd like to address the panel with that have come in. Thank you to all of you who are listening and watching. We are really appreciative of your comments. Candy asks, traditionally, male dancers of color have made more headways in ballet companies around the world than ballerinas. Can the panel discuss why the aesthetic of the ballerina has not welcomed Black women in numbers and only marginally recently? This is a question from Candy. To the panel, can any of you answer or share your thoughts on that question, please? So I'll, I'll jump in. I'm not an artistic director, so just to be clear. Uh, so I'm speaking just from my own experience uh, as a former dancer and uh, someone who loves the art form. Um, I do think uh, as part of this conversation, we have to, we have to look at the tr tradition of ballet. Um, and part of the beauty of the tradition is that there is this uh, passing down of, of the art form of practices and of aesthetic uh, that goes from generation to generation. And the reality is that um, most of these big ballet companies have um, nearly all white or all white uh, artistic teams, and that includes the National Ballet of Canada. Uh, and I do think uh, we, we have some work to do, first of all, to have those artistic teams better reflect uh, the dancers that they're facing in the room. And we have a, a, a wonderful artistic team at the National Ballet of Canada. They're, they're talented and they bring a great depth of experience to their work and to our artists. Uh, but at the same time, we really have to look at those teams and, and think about um, that they're sharing what's past, been passed down to them, what they know, they're sharing what they know. And, and their own lived experience. And uh, until we get uh, voices on those artistic teams that have had different lived experiences and can, that can be reflected in the work and the contribution that they make uh, to the artists, that I think that, that uh, that's a challenge. I, I, you know, when you, when you think about male, black male dancers, it is absolutely true that they've had greater success in classical ballet. Uh, and, and the reality is I, I believe it has to do with that aesthetic of the of the female corps de ballet that you know the line of swans has to look uh, has to look the same, and um, and I think that um, you know I, I don't believe that that, it, that those are the values of many in today's leadership of big ballet companies, and I think as generational change happens in our field, um, that 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 will continue to change. But I also think we have a responsibility as institutions to provide um, education and training to our current artistic staff and to our organizations to help them understand um, and have a greater, um, you know, certainly empathy, but also just greater knowledge 
of the lived experience of others uh, to really kind of move this conversation forward. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for that share. Anyone, Can anyone I, else, please? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is where it gets a little real. So the elephant in the room is, is basically systemic racism, right? Um, and implicit bias. And so my new theory is a bubble within a bubble. So ballet is a is a, a a culture a bubble that is that sits inside the larger bubble of the larger culture, right? Of you can say the country, the world, what have you. Um, and so inherent in the larger bubble is this is systemic racism um, that has beliefs about people and stereotypes about people. And so if you look at the tropes that are attached to specifically black women, um, you have the Jezebel, you have the Mammy, you have her as, as the worker, the, the, the mule, uh, uh, if you will, um, which do not align with the I ideal woman, right? The unobtainable, the desire, that beauty, that beauty, that purity that we we associate with the ballerina. So that's 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 one. You look at the male. Um, the idea of the the man in ballet is sort of like the laborer, right? Like he has to do all the heavy lifting, gets you know strong, supporting, macho, um, and you can see the black male fitting more easily into that idea, right? Now, black men have done better in ballet, true. Um, and we have Balanchine lifting up Arthur Mitchell, and that's, that's the first one that we can say, oh, you know, this is, this is the first black male. He and actually people like Sylvester Campbell and Benjamin Felix Dahl and Billy Wilson who were over um, in Amsterdam. But, um, the idea of the black man of as the prince or the cavalier is still not really as easily attainable as a black man as a principal in a role that is not in that classical, you know, ballerina prince sort of those roles. So I think that there are other things. Aesthetics absolutely play a part in it. Um, because again, the idea of the, the female, the black female body and it is that aligning with that European ballerina, very thin, looking looking very vulnerable. She needs to be supported. That doesn't align with, with female blackness. And so those are the things that if we're gonna talk about, if we're gonna pick apart aesthetics, um, then we need to pick those things apart as well because they're they're embedded within the the culture of ballet, right? That we don't like to talk about. Those are the things that we just, like to assume um, and being in rooms with artistic directors, when you ask them about aesthetics and you want to get into the weeds, right? Get into the nitty gritty about picking that apart. Like what is, what is the beauty? Well, what are you looking for? What is the criteria? It gets very hazy around that because I think that that's harder to put their finger on because it is an implicit bias. It's something that that is unconscious that we just assume that is a preference. Um, but I don't I don't necessarily think that it it is so much. I think it's very much like you know the devil wear de devil wears Prada, cerulean blue. It was chosen for you monologue. So then let's talk about that because one of the questions that has come in is this great concern, Teresa. Thank you for that share with regards to how relevant ballets such as Swan Lake, The Nutcracker, are a in particular to our global stories and diverse bodies. So are they? Are they relevant? Because the hard, the hard answers and the very open answers that are coming in are no, they're not relevant. So why do we continue to see Swan Lake, The Nutcracker? Thoughts on that to the panel. Are these stories relevant? right now to our global stories and diverse bodies. Anyone on the panel, please? Mavis, please. Mm. Um, before I answer that question, I would uh, like to go back to what you said, uh, Teresa, around aesthetics. And, and I actually agree that uh, 
the way you described a bubble inside a bubble is uh, accurate. And uh, we are talking about uh, um, systemic racism. And um, I think that uh, we're letting ourselves off the hook if we say that uh, um, especially those of us with the privilege of leadership positions and who have had the ease and privilege of uh, being white in a, a white supremacist society, that um, this is something where we can actually uh, um, uh, have people around us to, to push us to say, uh, are we um, making uh, uh, people of uh, different races, especially black people, feel comfortable right from the moment that they get interested in ballet and uh, in uh, how they see themselves in, in different environments. I think right now in terms of whether or not um, uh, Swan Lake and Nutcracker are especially relevant, um, I think for the moment they're actually, uh, unless it's uh, a production that challenges the stereotypical Swan Lakes and Nutcrackers, probably because we're in the middle of uh, a huge social uh, uh, eruption and revolution uh, launched by a pandemic, that they're going to be on the back burner and that people are going to need to see something that is more visceral and more reflective of the times. Because I do think one of dance's great strengths, including ballet, is that it does reflect history and, and changing times. Thank you, Mavis. Thank you for that share. Tonya, any thoughts? Um, I'm, I, I'm really looking forward to talking to Teresa more um, through the National Ballet because uh, there are things like subconscious things that we really do need to deal with. I would like to just Stress something that I feel um, is super important is in the what Mavis just said, nurturing that young person and making them feel really accepted by ballet at a young age. And if I look back at my my experience, um, I was probably not the best person um, technically in every situation, but there was always only one scholarship. So maybe I ticked all the boxes in enough of a way um, to fill that one scholarship. So if we can just keep making many more opportunities, because um, if I think back to my grade 12 class, the number of white dancers was quite high, but the number that turned over into professional dancers, not so much. And yet that program was not canceled. That program was not deemed unsuccessful because it didn't turn out um, so it'll take a long time uh, maybe, but we have to make sure that the programs that we implement, um, whether that whether the people um, in those programs actually want to become dancers um, at the end is irrelevant. I think that needs to just stay, um, you know, there needs to be 15 or 20 scholarships and, and harness that way. And then, um, you know, not just, uh, anyway, Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I jump in on the Nutcracker Swan Lake question? It's very please, please do. Thank you, Barry. Just, just very quickly. Um, so I do. When we talk about relevance, um, I, I think that there is a reality that we also have to acknowledge, which is that as the executive director of the organization, um, I am responsible for making sure that. Uh, that the organization is financially sustainable. And the reality is that uh, the Swan Lake uh, will sell, uh, you know, Balanchine once said that every ballet should be called Swan Lake. Swan Lake without fail will sell $3 million in sales in Toronto in one run. Um, and uh, Bill Forsyth Contemporary Program will sell seven or $800,000 in ticket sales. Um, and so there is, Swan Lake and Nutcracker both are um, some of the fuel that allows major ballet companies to do a lot of the other repertoire that they that they do, uh, and so I'm 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 trying to be thoughtful about the fact that I I don't think uh, Swan Lake and Nutcracker are irre irrelevant because quite frankly if they were irrelevant nobody would be buying tickets to see them, um, so I think they are relevant I think they're important works of art they're, they're you know Swan Lake the Petipa Ivanov Tchaikovsky Swan Lake is an exquisite 
masterpiece in its own way. Um, and I think, uh, I, I just wanna be thoughtful that we are in, in sort of in the lens of cancel culture that we, we understand that actually they are still relevant. It, that, can we cast them differently? Um, can there be uh, new versions invented that expand on their legacy? Absolutely. Um, but I would not say they're irrelevant. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, Banked, when we think about the relevancy as well. Your thoughts? Well, as a choreographer, both Swan Lake and uh, The Nutcracker and Sleeping Beauty and all of the other works, um, I obviously speak with a bias on this. I think it is important, <clears throat> again, to, to remember that <clears throat> we can do Swan Lake and it doesn't have to look the way Swan Lake looked 100 years ago. And we don't have to tell it from the same lens. We do not have to tell Sleeping Beauty from the lens of, you know, the imperial court and glorifying an autocratic, basically dictatorship, both in France and in, in Russia. Um, and so you can restage these works. And so they're completely relevant. But we have focused here in, in our companies to put them through a Canadian lens uh, and making them far more egalitarian uh, and telling stories that come from Canada. And basically what drives these works are usually the music. I mean, let's be honest, there's some really wonderful classical ballet passages uh, that we all want to keep. Um, but what, what has kept these works alive is the music, it, it's what moves dancer. And I think that uh, there's absolutely no reason we can't do a Swan Lake with, uh, you know, a black Swan Queen and a black Prince. And I, to Teresa's point, uh, you know, I, it's hard to, to understand today why this is an issue, but it is systemic and it is clearly our unconscious biases. And we need to do better because these are great works and it can be enjoyed by everyone and it can be danced by everyone. To Barry's point too, there obviously is an interest in these works, but I think as a community, we can also make sure that we stage them in a context where we don't perpetuate stereotypes, or at least we can try not to perpetuate them and do the very best we can and continue to build together on doing a better job with that. So that's what I have to say as obviously somebody that has a bias for these great classics. I think they should be shared and seen by as many people as possible, but in a context that does not perpetuate stereotypes and we have to work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Banked. Mavis has a share on that. I see your hand up. What is your share, please, Mavis? Um, uh, I would just like to reinforce that Banked, I think you captured the point that uh, I was aiming to make um, it's, uh, there, there are many ways to tell those stories, but Barry, I think that we've all been given a gift in the most, uh, perverse kind of way through COVID-19 in that, uh, nobody can do Nutcracker in the traditional way. So all of us are being forced to say in this period of time where, um, uh, productions are not in the traditional opera house, which we all, uh, talk about being a concern because uh, it's not economically viable for so many. We suddenly have this opportunity to say, how do we draw people into the beauty and wonder of some of these classics that can be filtered in the um, uh, variety of ways that you described, Banked? Excellent. Thank you, Mavis. Greatly appreciate your share as well. We have a, another question that has come in from Sheila who's discussing the fact that I find it very hard to go up the ranks as a black dancer, as a dancer of color. I feel like I don't have the opportunity to be able to move any further because of how I look to people around me because of the color of my skin. I'm curious to hear uh, your thoughts, Kirsten, with regards to how your experience has been working through the ranks, do you feel like there's an added responsibility for you now? Um, I do, to a certain degree, um, think that. But I also joined Boston Ballet with an understanding that I might have that responsibility and I was okay with it. Um, it's challenging to be uh, one of the few in a room and, and to, to feel like you're not seen in the same light as everyone else has, um, for things that, that, that you, you can't change. Um, I have found that I've been really lucky in the space that I'm in, um, that I, I've, I've found success at Boston Ballet. And, and I, I think it's because of the opportunities that I've 
was given when I initially joined this company gave me the space to show who I was um, as a person. And I, I think that that is what has made me valued in this space. Um, I don't, I don't know that I, that I'm directly answering your question, but I'm not sure. No, I appreciate your share because it's coming from (laughs) an honest place. I think this is something that has been a a difficult um, share. And when I, again, reflect back to the individual who's asked it, going up the ranks, living within the ballet space, the dance space has been challenging. So what does that look like when I feel like I'm the only one that looks like myself in the room? Um, yeah, and I think that there there is definitely like that level of responsibility when you when you are the only person in the room that you are not only representing yourself as an artist, but you're representing what can feel like your entire race or your entire culture, um, and it can be really challenging and overwhelming to have that added le- like amount of work on top of the challenge of doing ballet as it is. Indeed, thank you, thank you, and we do have another question as well. Uh, My apologies if I pronounce the name incorrectly. Cole, K-O-L, Cole asks, does socioeconomic disparity between white and minority populations affect the ability for diversity to thrive in the arts? Ballet is costly, says Cole. Any thoughts to anyone on the panel? Um, I'll I'll start. I'm sure we all have opinions on this. The answer is yes. Um, Socioeconomic factors are are a gigantic barrier for a lot of people. And uh, we need to continue as as an art form to work to break them down. Uh, You know, access is one of the biggest problems that we have. And it ghettoizes our art form. And that's terrible. Um, So, yeah. I mean, the short answer is it has a huge uh, impact on on our form, at least what I'm seeing. Thank you. Thank you, Banked. Anyone else, please, before we move to our next question? This is a trick question because yes and no. Yes, ballet is expensive. Um, and it is a barrier, but it's okay. So this, all this is a numbers game. It's all percentages, right? Like it really is. Um, the idea that, that the, the problem I have with, with, with this kind of question is that it creates um, the mo- blackness one as a monolith and then it, it, it makes blackness synonymous with poverty. And the reality of the, the, the matter is, is, is I was a dancer to Harlem a little before <laughs> Kirsten. And the reality of it is, it, when I was in that school, when I was in the company, it was full and, and bursting at the rafters. And we were all from working and middle class families. And the reality of it is, is that most ballet dancers come from working and middle class families. And so, um, to, to, to say that this is the thing um, ghettoizes the, the conversation. Um, I will submit that um, the issue more uh, has to do with the idea that um, a lot of ballet schools and companies are conflating their outreach programs with diversity initiatives. And whenever they're talking about you know wanting to diversify, they're looking towards the the part of the black community that is um, in the most economic crisis, right? And the reality of it is, is ballet is a middle class um, art form, right? It has it it the structures of family need to be such that you know you can cart your 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 little one to and from you know ballet school. Somebody you can need a babysitter. There's all those things that we know, right? So the idea of of saying that, oh, we're going to focus our attention on the underserved or, you know, underrepresented, that's probably not right, but you don't need the underserved or the economically disadvantaged means that you're creating this, like, that's 10 to 12, 15 years of support. That's really, un- it's not sustainable, right? And so they don't also have the, the family support to sustain that. I submit that if we look actually towards the middle class, the working and middle class, there is a black community that is working in middle class. You you might have more um, success, 
right? Um, and then we have to also look at the way that 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 things are set up as well, because when you don't see representation, when you don't see a possibility for your child, you know, um, you're going to, you know, usher them into another direction, right? Like you need to go to school, you need to have, I mean, that's just arts in general, like parents are like, you need to have something to fall back on. But there, there's the conversation, and I'll say this from a, <clears throat> from a working class, you know, middle class family, that's in every time I hear it, I get a feeling because if it 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 makes me feel not seen, and it also stigmatizes brown bodies in once they're in the space. So once you're in the space of ballet, the, and you're a brown body, then your body is synonymous with you being poor, right? Which is not always the case. So it's it is very complex. Is it an issue? Yes, but it's not the only issue. And I don't even know if it's the largest issue. Does that make sense? Ah, uh, it does. It does. And with just a few minutes left, Teresa, I'm thinking about also... Uh, Nicole, can I just can I just add something? I, I don't disagree for one bit, but I think that socioeconomically, it stretch, it's not just about black, it's about a lot of people cannot access it. So, you know, I think it's it's important. I think you're absolutely right when it comes to uh, the middle class. Because if I look at who's asking for scholarship, it goes, you know, it's it's straight, it's people that come from the middle class, they're struggling to pay. So I think economic issues is a problem for art form in general, and it's across the board, not just for black. And, and I, I wanna just clarify that, uh, yeah it's important to, to acknowledge that it's, it's not about black people, it's about the fact that generally speaking, a lot of people can't afford to participate in our forum and that's a problem. I agree. Teresa, do you have a response? No, with that, I absolutely agree with, you know, but I think that when we, when we attach that to the lack of people, you know, in the form, that's where it gets a little that's where it gets a little dodgy it's the same thing that goes in again it's like the stereotyping that goes into like oh we have to teach them how to appreciate the art form right like we have to like like a lack of sophistication those are implicit biases that get attached and i'm talking specifically to to black people now right that that are inherently problematic because they're they're just absolutely not true Right, so like there's there's an idea that people from um, whatever race cannot necessarily um, quote unquote appreciate the form, um, and historically blacks have been in ballet um, in North America since um, you know 1846, when um, George Washington Smith, who was rumored to be mulatto, um, performed the premiere of Giselle in North America, and the first uh, Black Ballet School was opened in 1919. So we've been in the form and, and, and we, we get it. So I just want to be careful that we're not, um, you know, stereotyping. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. And I want to also come back to an article that both yourself, Teresa, and Barry, both of you were uh, presented in that article. Barry, in an August 6th article for the New York Times, in your work with Teresa, you were quoted as having said, your conversations have helped you to think more deeply about equity in all dimensions of the National Ballet, not just in hiring dancers. For a while, we were focused on representation on the company, looking more racially diverse, and it does look more racially diverse. But now it's like turning inward and saying, what do these artists need to feel support and safety and to see themselves on a path through and up the ranks? And so as we are coming to a, a close, a fast close here today, one of the questions that is asked as well from one of our viewers is, well, action plans. What does that look like? What do action plans look like for organizations? What is happening with that? So Barry, as a follow-up, can you talk about action plans in particular, please? 
Absolutely. So the National Ballet of Canada has been working in partnership with an organization called Cultural Pluralism and the Arts Movement Ontario uh, for the last almost three years now uh, in uh, building a, an institutional uh, equity, diversity and inclusion plan for the National Ballet of Canada. And um, I'm embarrassed to say that we didn't start this work 20 years ago. Um, I wasn't here 20 years ago, um, but I do think it's important that the work is happening now. And I think it's really about um, accountability. It's about uh, it's about any plan, and I think, I guess I have I feel about this a couple of different ways. First of all, Teresa is constantly reminding me to to get into my heart space. That I think as leaders of larger institutions, that we get very fixated on policy and procedure and strategic plans and planning, and um, and uh, sometimes we forget that. There's humanity within the institutions we run um, and that we have to be really conscious of what it feels like to be part of our community and what is the humanity of our organization. And that's one thing. So I, I just wanna put that out there that I, I think we have to actually do more of that as leaders. We have, to, we have to get more into the heart space and understand how people feel. That said, I also think there's, it's really important in a big institution that there are there is planning and that there is accountability and that we hold each, each other accountability to sort of a standard and a direction. Um, and so this plan that we've been working on with CPAMO um, is, uh, has been uh, developing in multiple layers. We began uh, by doing an international assessment of this work uh, with major ballet companies around the world. So uh, the folks at Sipamo uh, reached out to ballet companies around the world to talk about uh, the, this issue um, and also to understand how other ballet companies uh, were we're, uh, we're working toward this or quite frankly, not working uh, toward this. Um, and then that report was generated. It, that was followed by a series of stakeholder meetings uh, across the organization, board level, staff level, artists, dancers, orchestra, um, and, and outside stakeholders uh, to really talk about um, what this work means in the context of driving the National Ballet of Canada forward um, and also um, our role as, as an institution within our society. Um, and those conversations were in small groups. Uh, they happened over a period of about 18 months. And I think um, all of that information was sort of synthesized and um, bubbled up to um, the task force uh, uh, and the senior management of the organization. And we're now in the process of putting that into an actionable plan that is over the next three to five years. These are the steps we will take. These are the the stakeholders who are going to be held accountable to us reaching uh, reaching each of these goals, um, and and I'm hopeful. I'm actually quite hopeful that uh, that it's going to drive sustainable change, not only for our institution, but uh, but will be an example uh, for others in our field uh, as we move forward. Uh, but I want to be really clear, and Teresa and I uh, <laughs> disagreed on this, and um, and and I was I ended up being in the wrong. I'll acknowledge. Uh, but, you know, Teresa in the very beginning said when we when we got involved in the equity project, she said, you know, you have to talk about this work. You have to be don't be afraid to talk about the fact that you're doing this work. Um, and I uh, I felt like we shouldn't talk about it until until there was traction, until we were really doing the work, until we could authentically and with integrity say we were in it. Um, and so we didn't talk about it. And then um, after the murder of George Floyd, uh, you know, there was this this huge uprising, including a dancer in our own company who just spoke out. And and I have to say, um, you know, it. So now I think the 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 what Teresa was trying to protect us against was this idea that it's all because of that of, of that moment of that flashpoint that suddenly now we're leaning into this work when in fact at the National Ballet we've been working on it for a while now. Um, and so I, it's a delicate balance because you don't want to get ahead of the work. Uh, I think a lot of organizations are really good at producing annual reports with pretty glossy pictures and that show uh, representation um, when in fact the organization, it's, it's not what's being lived within the organization. So I do think it's a balance of those two things and really leaning in and doing the work and holding people accountable and then also letting uh, the world know that what, what you're up to. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for sharing that. And we are coming to a close. I, I do wish the conversations like this could continue on for, or at least this live could continue on until midnight because there's so much that, uh, that we can share today. And 
one of the things that we really wanted to address, actually, before I do that, I just want to come back to a point that Barry made mention of. You mentioned Sapamo. For those of you listening and watching, that is the cultural pluralism in the arts movement, Ontario, Sapamo. So you can check them out at Sapamo, that's C-P-A-M-O dot org for more information. And Teresa, I wanted to go to you right now because as we look at action plans implementing change, you had put together the 12 steps to ballet's cultural recovery. Can you share where that can be found for individuals? Uh, and I know that we may not be able to go through all of those steps today, but it's really, I think, important that individuals know where it can be found. Right now, you can find it um, on my Instagram feed, but I will post it on maballet.org. It's something that was... Um, that I created for a, a keynote um, speech um, at the Positioning Ballet Conference in Amsterdam for the Dutch National Ballet, and then sort of like reworked it as 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 I got more as I dug deeper into the work, and it's it's just for me I, I entered this work through the diversity sort of lane, but that led me to really look at the broader issue of the actual culture of ballet. So like if we it, again, the bubble inside the bubble, right? So the diversity issue is a bubble that's inside the, the issue of the culture of ballet itself. Um, and and there are other issues that ballet has, you know, um, that that we we have the opportunity to um, to start to adjust and and really interrogate um, and 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 find the solutions to because these young this younger generation that's coming up they what they require is is vastly different than what my generation required or the generation before me um so yes yeah, so i will post them on maballet.org thank you teresa you know reading through those 12 steps was just jarring really and so key to see words like admit that ballet has a problem and that our culture has become unmanageable. That's one of the, the steps that you had made mention of in uh, the 12 steps to ballet's cultural recovery. The second being imagine, imagine, pardon me, examined past errors associated with institutional racism and white privilege and make amends for them. And in fact, I'm getting the go ahead to go over by a couple of minutes. I, I'm hoping that that is okay with the panel is that okay with all of you yes i'm putting you on the spot thank you because <laughs> i think it is so important to address these 12 steps so teresa i am going to come back to you please and ask you if you can in fact make mention of those steps at this time please um oh wait i have to Okay, so we've got you on mute. Oh, thank I got you. <laughs> um, I have to pull them up because I don't actually know them by heart. But I actually, you know, I have, I have a, I like to think I have a wicked sense of humor. And that's, that's okay. We <laughs> have them all ready awesome. for you. And so. and when I um, I, the work reminded me of being like in, in rehab, you know. So I I looked at the twelve steps for for Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was like, well, wow, this some mm -hmm. of this is actually applicable in a way, you know, because we do have to kind of reform ourselves. Um, and so, so basically it steps through some of the things that were, that, that had been identified as issue. Of course, the first step is like realize that you have a problem. Um, and it, it, some of them go through, you know, like analyze um, heritage, traditions, artistic standards of, of aesthetics, which we all talked we talked about in as 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 uh, issues that we need to kind of address, but just formalizing them in into some really key bullets that everybody you know leaders and organizations or or and ballet organizations whether that's companies or schools can begin to kind of like create a checklist for themselves like are we doing this where do we stand on on these issues um, I just think it might be helpful and it might also create, um, a, you could see it as a tool um, that we can use to communicate, right? Across the field, you know, to say, where are we? When we ask like, make amends, you, you have to acknowledge, you're inviting people in now 
But you do have to acknowledge that they were excluded because um, going back to, to Barry and what he said about what I said about transparency is, you know, there's an inherent lack of trust, right? An inherent lack of trust baseline between black people and white people, which is historically founded, right? And that bubble inside a bubble thing, it, it extends to ballet. And so, you know, as a black person, I will say, I want to see your work to know that that's authentic, right? Because white people are constantly going into a back room and, and powwowing with themselves. Sorry, that's probably not the right word to use. Caucusing with themselves, right? And then coming out with a construct and being like, ta-da, don't you want it? Don't you love it? And black people are supposed to accept it. And that's inherently problematic. So I think that building trust is about allowing us to see your hands while you're doing the work, because usually they're up to a magic trick, right? And so it's a, I, for me, it's, it's, it's key. You know, if people understand you and understand what you're doing and why, they can be more accepting, right? And understanding if you falter, because we understand what you were, what your intention was. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And we are taking our audience right now through those 12 steps and sharing them on screen as you're discussing. You made mention that they will also be posted. Teresa, is that at, at mobballet.org? <laughs> yes, I've created work for myself, but yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, and individuals can find it there. We've so far shared um, the steps from one to eight, and we're also going to share the last uh, few right now as well, because it's important that you also see the last that are remaining up to 12. We share them now with you. For more information and to see that, folks, we invite you definitely to go to mobballet.org to find them. This is the last few steps that lead up to 12. Teresa, thank you for sharing this vital, vital information as we look forward to recovery and ensuring that that is feasible for us all. And again, that's there for you folks. We're going to remove it from the screen, but invite you to again, visit mobballet.org for more information. And as we are coming to a close, I, I really do want to just go back to doing a check-in with regards to where we are at and where we are, are going, and in particular, abolishing the stereotypes, implementing change. Any last thoughts from the panel with regards to today's talk and what you're hoping to leave with our audience today? Mavis, please do share. Mm. Um, I think a uh, uh, couple of things that, that struck me. One is uh, uh, that um, we need to make sure that this is not a, a hit and run endeavor, that this is uh, um, a lifelong commitment from generation to generation. And I think that takes very realistic measurements um, and uh, you know, measured against those 12 st steps, but to be constantly taking the temperature and have people saying, are you just paying lip service, service to this or is there evidence to the change? Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Mavis. And to the rest of the panel, any last shares that you would have to that point? We do have questions that have come in from viewers, listeners who've asked, where do I go? What tips do I have? Or pardon me, what tips are available? Um, questions from individuals asking like Victoria, I teach dance to many children, what tips? So where can individuals go? We've provided what I believe is a great resource, which is this talk. Uh, any other tips and suggestions? Teresa, your share, please. Yeah, I have, um, I created, we just completed um, the Mob Ballet uh, Virtual Symposium, and I uh, generated a resource guide that is also on uh, Mob Ballet. Um, and so you can find that under resources. Oh, that's where I'll post the 12 steps. There you go. So there's great readings, and it was crowdsourced. Some of it was from the Equity Project. Some of it was from the um, participants um, of the symposium. And so that will be a growing sort of um, repository for information. 
Excellent. Thank you. Yes, because that is a common question. Kristen as well asked, what can I change in my practice as a ballet teacher to make BIPOC students feel welcomed, loved, and cherished in my studio? So thank you to each of you for sharing those questions today. It's imperative that they keep coming. We invite you to continue to keep asking them. To Tanya, Kirsten, your thoughts as you leave with us today, please. Um, I, I know that we've had some questions as well coming in for the both of you. We have some fans that have been saying that we're so curious as well to hear the thoughts of these dancers as well and, and how they face and how they look at diversity, inclusion, and more. Any thoughts from either of you, please? I'll, I'll just say quickly, I think um, this is fairly new for me. I'm of the generation where um, we used to have our teachers tell us, leave your personal stuff at the door and before you come into the studio. And when we come, you know, when we're in the studio, it's just ballet. And it's very um, hopeful that that has changed and people are, um, free to say how they feel um, openly. And one of your, one lady was just asking um, how she can make her, her kids feel loved and um, just natural human, nobody needs a different thing. Everyone needs to belong to something. Everyone needs to feel like they have a purpose. Um, these are just basic um, human interactions that don't, don't, um, uh, they're not divided by by anything. Um, maybe that's what I wanted to say. I, there was one other thing. If I remember it, I'll pop. Up. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for your share, Kirsten. Your thoughts, please. Um, I just want to encourage all of the dancers of today to not be afraid to speak about what it is that they might be feeling in if they feel like there might be some sort of discrimination or there might be some sort of bias that is there against you. Um, because I think a lot of, a lot of things change if you, if you speak up about it. I've, I've had instances where, where, where people had assumptions about um, how I should wear my hair on stage or something like that. And it wasn't until I opened up the conversation that, 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 that space to make that change was there. Um, but directly to the question about teaching students, um, I would just say, try to find a way to make your space more accessible to all of them. And I mean that in saying, you know, speaking of hair, um, if, you, if you have a, a, a young black woman that has hair that's textured differently and doesn't go up into a bun, don't alienate them by, by trying to make them put their hair into a bun, but instead having their hair up and off of their neck or um, just finding a way to make, to, to make ballet feel like a safe and, and, and um, welcoming space with, with what your demands are as far as like what you want, want them to be in, in the room. Um, and, and what, to what Tanya was saying about love, just love from your heart and, and understand that the needs of everyone is different. That's all. Indeed. Just do it, right? <laughs> just love from your heart. Thank you for that, Kirsten. And to those of you, to Barry, Banked, Mavis, any last shares, Teresa, last shares that you would give us before we leave you today. Just going back to what Teresa said, you know, trust is everything. And I think in ballet, we start training as dancers at a very young age. And there's sort of a power figure at the front of the room. And we are the children and we do what we're told. We, we speak when spoken to and we do what we're told. And that is a, that is a system of training that has, uh, has been in place for a long, long time. And what happens is there's no graduation from that system into a professional company. There's like this, still this, this, this sort of um, power differential, you know, the person at the front of the room is the grown up and the dancers in the room are the children. And the reality is that the national dancers of the National Ballet are not children, they're adults. And, um, and we need to create an environment where they feel safe uh, to speak up uh, when, they, when they feel think something is wrong and not be afraid that there will be consequences that will impact their career. Because I think this has been one of the, the great barriers to progress is that dancers 
um, fear consequences of speaking up. And so we are spending a lot of time right now having small group meetings. Um, some of those meetings are facilitated by the dancers themselves, among themselves, to talk about work culture and talk about the kinds of the kind of place that they'd like to be a part of. It doesn't mean that hierarchy is not going to exist because I think in any sort of large structure, there needs to be some sense of, of accountability and reporting. Uh, but we should have an environment where there can be trust that if I speak out, if I don't feel safe, if I, um, if I believe that, that um, change is in order, that um, having a voice in bringing that to the surface is not going to be to the detriment of my career. And I think that's the, the mission of, of large dance institutions right now is to make sure we're creating that environment. Excellent. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for your share. Banked, Mavis, any last shares for us today, please? And Teresa? Mavis, please. Um, just uh, to go back to the issue of uh, um, the responsibility when you're working with children and youth to um, um, underscore all of the time that it is about helping them find their voices. And uh, Kristen, uh, you reminded me that some of the most important uh, learning in all my years in this role, but probably in the past four months in particular, is what the uh, current students are saying and how they wanted to reach out to alumni and how they are creating surveys where uh, um, initially it can feel especially safe to uh, give feedback about uh, discrimination um, and uh, their commitment to saying we're going to continue to be the vital force where the future and um, uh, again I think it, it's um, it's remembering that often it's the emerging uh, uh, generation that we have to make particularly sure that we're listening to carefully enough. Indeed, indeed, thank you, Mavis. And Teresa, I think I saw you raise your hand just a second ago, you did? I, I did, I mean, I, this, is, this is what's interesting is that like, um, I think that out of this terrifying sort of period of, of time, um, what will emerge is that we'll have a new paradigm, right? For at least, at the very least, for communication in, um, in the ballet world, right? Like we, we're having dancers um, who before have been infantilized, right? Um, stepping up and feeling empowered and creating a sort of um, a level playing field for leadership and dancers to speak on an equal um, as humans, right? Like this is my experience. This is how you make me feel. I acknowledge that. Like that is something that didn't normally happen, right? And, and not, you know, unless it was in a company meeting and that's a hierarchical sort of situation. So I, that's really exciting for me. And it, it, I, I feel very positive about sort of, sort of some of the cultural changes that already have begun to, um, to emerge. Um, and then finally, I think I'd say that, um, you know, uh, writer Nicole Hannah-Jones um, of the New York Times, and she uh, created the 1619 Project. She says, um, this is, you know, systemic raci racism is a system that it took centuries to build. And so it's not going to take just 10 years to dismantle. So the idea that everybody has to realize that this is, this is a long game. This is a marathon. And um, it's going to take time. And it's a constant learning. So... Um, sort of infusing your your thought or whatever that is with sort of empathy and compassion for the process, um, I think is is it will be helpful because people have to be allowed to fail if they're going to succeed, and you know so we don't want you know white guys like Barry feeling afraid in spaces because we need them to be able to be them full, their full selves, right, in that space. And, and there needs to be an allowing um, for everybody to, to, to grow and get educated and learn and evolve together. And so that's, that's sort of my, my, my hope, you know, um, it will ebb and flow. And, and, and that's, that's the process of growth. It's, it's going to be a little messy, but I think it'll be worth it. I think so too. It's going to be messy, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it is certainly worth it. To all of you, 
each of you, thank you for your voices. They are so needed and greatly appreciated. We have so many comments and messages of thanks that are coming in from so many. Thank you to you, Banked, Teresa, Mar Barry, pardon me, Mavis, Tanya, Kirsten, your voices are, are just incredible. Such a pleasure and an honor to sit down with all of you today. Thank you again to Canada's Ballet Jorgen for inviting Turnout Radio to partner on today's talk. And for more on the panel discussion, contact Ballet Jorgen at marketingassociate at balletjorgen.ca. And for resources, you can also contact turnoutradio.com. My thanks again to each of you, Tanya, Kirsten, Barry, Banks, Teresa, Mavis. I look forward to seeing you after the talk and having more discussions like this one. To our listening audience, your time has been so appreciated. We thank you as well for joining us today. And we invite you, continue to keep not only the conversation going, but put action into place. Grateful for today's discussion. I'm Nicole Hamilton from Turnout Radio, looking so forward to sitting down with all of you again. Bye for now. <laughs>